Today we're going to talk about conquering the challenges of building and deploying omni-channel digital experiences. This is a huge mouthful uh, of words. Um, and obviously this topic could go in any number of directions, like deep development stuff, high-level strategic stuff. Um, show of hands, who's a developer in the room? Okay. Good, there's most of you are developers. I'm not going to talk about any like nitty-gritty code, so don't get mad at me. I am a nerd. I am running Linux here as proof. I just submit that as my uh, proof. But if you want to ask nerdy questions at the end, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Mint. Uh, okay. So let's start at the beginning. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Russ Danner. I'm VP of Products at Crafter CMS. I'm also a co-founder there. Um, I really started my career in software in industrial automation at a steel mill, cutting metal with fire. It was pretty awesome. But uh, in the early 2000s, I was thinking, you know, this internet stuff is pretty cool, and I need to get into it. So I moved to Boston from Pennsylvania. I'm a Pennsylvania native, and, uh, and got involved in the web at a publishing organization. Then after that, got into consulting, got a ton of exposure to digital experience, working for some really large organizations, and then uh, started Crafter CMS in 2013 as an open source project. Crafter CMS is a headless, open source, Git-based CMS. I'm not going to talk about Crafter CMS in this talk too much. I might say, hey, we do this, we do that. Pretty much everything in here that's an idea is something that we think about, that we do. You can kind of infer uh, that about Crafter CMS from this talk, but I want to talk about the space in general. So I'm not going to talk about Crafter CMS directly. It's not a sales pitch or a, a use my open source pitch per se. Maybe I'll come back to that. Um, okay. I'm also into mountain climbing, and as my uh, screen showed, I really like uh, motorcycles, specifically track days and uh, racing, and I'm um, into enterprise architecture. Okay, I really love the combination of people and process and business and, and software. Um, and you might think, like, hey, you know, two of the, you know, one of these things is not like the other. But I would, uh, I would say that that's not true. They are all... Uh, technically challenging spaces. They require, um, they're technical, they're challenging, and uh, they require a lot of perseverance to get good at them. And when you do, it's pretty rewarding, okay? So, and I think that we're going to find that this space of digital experience is very similar to that. Also, uh, similar in all these spaces is that we you know, we come to these conferences, we're hoping that people are going to give us kind of like the direct answer, the direct uh, this is the recipe to success, and we know in the back of our minds that, well, it's not going to be that direct, but um, when we've all seen this diagram, this is really the reality of how we get uh, to where we want to go, and this is kind of the first macro pattern that I want to share with you guys on this topic, is that the path to success is not direct in this space, or really anything at the enterprise scale. Um, where digital started for me was with this Amstrad computer. I'm going to date myself pretty hard here. Um, and uh, specifically, at the time, of this game called Space Quest. I don't know. You see some people who might have played Space Quest. Who has played Space Quest? OK, awesome. Not too many of you. But for me, it was really inspiring. I, it got me into computers. I had this in Highlight Magazine. And I like, wanted to learn to program and open hex editors and hack this game and figure it out. Right? It's interactive 3D stuff, early 90s, late 80s. Really amazing. On the Amstrad, it looked like this. Pretty bad. <laughs> um, pretty, uh, pretty pixel hunty for, for me. Um, and this game, very similar to what we were just talking about. Very challenging. Uh, lots of ways to die. Um, and they didn't uh, shy away from showing all of those and making fun of you when you did. And uh, I think it just embodies a lot of, of this. Now, I'm not just sort of like showing this to you uh, to stroll down memory lane, but I just want to I'll kind of put this in context. This is a time which was signal, single channel, right? You, if you wanted to buy something, you had to go to the store. We couldn't even put our computers online. It wasn't for a while till we got modems and got BBSs. And, but it was a time where there was a major shift going on between uh, mainframes to personal computers. There was sort of a decentralization of computing going on. And this idea of major swings is something I want you to start to pay attention to which is why I'm bringing this up. I'm not just taking a trip down nostalgia lane here at the Emerging Technologies Conference by talking about stuff from the 80s. I think that it's important that we think about where we've come from because of this curve. 
Okay. Now, who, who knows what kind of curve this is? What kind of curve is this? It's what? It's, well, and it's, what's, what's the shape of the curve? Exponential, right? So exponential curves, right, they start off really shallow, and they start to, they get into an elbow, and then they go really deep. The interesting thing about the shallow part of the curve and into the elbow is that we kind of predict the future by looking at the past. Once we hit that elbow, we can't really tell what tomorrow looks like based on yesterday because we're going sort of straight up. We're, no, we're not there yet. We are in the elbow. Um, and I, but I think this, this rate of advancement is a key concept when we start to think about things like omnichannel and all these advances. Uh, another key concept on, on this sort of line is the rate of adoption of technical advancement. Okay? So you can see technology is advancing a lot faster than people, individuals, can pick it up. That's faster than more businesses can pick it up. Whoa. Okay, over there? All right. Uh, and it's faster than public policy can pick it up. And that's an important fact. Like as we talk about privacy, as we talk about what, what does AI mean for this space and so on. This, this adoption curve is a huge piece of information for us to watch, especially as the technology starts to go sharper and sharper up. So this isn't the second macro pattern. We need to acknowledge the accelerating rate of change. Now, in 2001, just kind of jumping ahead, this is where I started my career and, uh, in, in web, and this is what Google looked like. I was working at a newspaper. This is what our major one of our major competitors' websites looked like. Uh, this is eBay.com, a, a crafter user, um, who uh, this is what their website looked like, doing e-commerce, and uh, Nintendo.com, pretty fancy flash site there. I mean, these are like real, you know, this is, seems like forever ago, but these are real sites. And this is a really multi-channel. This was a time where we actually had sales going on, online and in a physical place, and people were trying to figure out how to make that experience consistent. And um, you know, we tend not to think of this as multi-channel, but this is the origins of multi-channel. And this initially, obviously, the dot-com boom didn't go so well. But after that, we really started to get our stuff together. And we were pretty sophisticated about it. In 2001, we, this was technology that I worked with. ATG uh, Dynamo's personalization server and scenario server. We could, you know, target ads into slots on pages, make content dynamic. It's not, this is, you know, back, this is, you know, more than 20 years ago. So we were doing that then, and I think we thought, hey, we have this all figured out. This is great. You know, we'll just keep doing more of this. We're going to keep sharpening our tools, doing this better, you know, uh, switching from proprietary servers to things like an ATG to things like Tomcat and going from, proprietary frameworks to things like Struts, because Struts was awesome at the time. And, um, you know, we have this all figured out. Then, uh, you know, we had these stacks, the, these monolithic stacks that were our data tier and our business logic and our presentation were all in that one stack. And this stack actually ran from that early 2000 period as, as, as a popular stack, even up into the 2010s. And some people still have it today. That's another important thing to think about is that on the maturity model, there are plenty of people running still on these monolithic stacks. And this is uh, another moment, one of the reasons I bring this up is another moment where we see something happen in this pattern of, you know, a big shifts, big swings. But this time, it's not uh, a, a complete swing of the pendulum. We're actually really seeing the web being used as uh, a middle ground, a thin client uh, in a client-server environment. And really, since then, we've been kind of pushing around how much should be on the thin client, right? That's basically what's been happening since this time for the last 20 years. And this formally is called Hegel's dialectic, right? The idea that you have a thesis, you have an antithesis, you do some figuring out in that space, and out pops a new thesis. So this is, a, this is a, an important kind of concept that happens at, at the enterprise uh, technology and enterprise architecture level all the time. New conditions breed new answers, right? So I want to keep track of that. Now, everything was, uh, you know, proceeding until this guy showed up. An iPod, a phone, <laughs> and an internet communicator. An iPod, <laughs> a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. 
This is one device, and we are calling it iPhone. And these guys showed up, right, uh, with, with mature social networks. Now, you, again, I mean, we all have these phones, and it's like nothing to us now. But this is 2008. This isn't that far away from where, where we, you know, this, we're not that far away from that time, and we've come a long way since. So I think it really, uh, you know, shows how quick things are going, and that's, and that's be not even the point here. The point is that this technology, again, shifted things in a major way, connected everybody to each other online in a bi-directional fashion. So, you know, the internet sort of democratized publishing, but social networking made it n-directional. It's very powerful, and it's uh, shifted the power dynamic. I love this picture from the fail whale. I know it's, you know, it's more about um, having fun and functional. I, I watched a video explaining this. I, what I see in this is, you know, a king of its domain being lifted out of that space into a new space by a, like a collective uh, community. I really think this could, this could be, despite what it might be, could be transformative technology, and it certainly has transformed things. Uh, this is also the time where we really see true digital natives, and we have not yet seen the impact of what a digital native can bring, uh, will bring to our society, right? As I, I was a kid, I had access to a computer, but I didn't have, and, I, and, as, and as a teenager, I had a Nokia phone, and I was always connected, but nothing like these kids, right? So, and this is, again, this is uh, only in 2008, so some of, you know, this, these, these kids are still entering the, just entering the workforce, starting to enter the workforce, think about working, things like that. So uh, this is a big shift. Uh, this also caused like a lot of um, destruction of, of where I work, destruction of like uh, old business models, newspapers going away, stuff like that. A lot of turmoil at that time. Uh, people didn't really know what to do, making uh, MDOT sites instead of, uh, you know, uh, you know to, to have, to, to support things like the iPhone. Uh, then. Another important thing happened where they, they created the, uh, the Apple Store, the Play Store, people could make apps, right? So, so now you could plug in things into these devices, and that's a key concept. I think we saw that in the CMS space, too. People starting to plug things in, make these platforms extensible by outside developers. Key concept here, and a lot, lot of development options. And of course, technology matured. People didn't want to have MDOT sites, and we have responsive sites. And again, I don't want to talk too much about that. We've added digital assistance, we've added IoT, and I think we've gotten to a space that's like, what is cross-channel today? Now, what is cross-channel? Cross-channel means that we want to be able to communicate with our customer across all of these different channels, digital assistance, our website, our native apps, um, and, and so on. We want, to we want to communicate with them in a consistent way. We want them to go to the same back end. And you know, the, you know, and, and and this is very typical thing, uh, where you go to online to order something from Home Depot, and then you go pick it up at the store, and you can get status updates on your phone. This is where a lot of people are in this maturity model, where people want to be, is omnichannel, which is uh, you know kind of what we're talking about. And I just want to say, you know, talk a little bit about what it is. This is much more connected. This is an experience that's more of a journey. And uh, at Crafter, we have a lot of customers, uh, cruise lines and things like that, that, that are, are really in the space where they want the, the experience of the user to hand off between devices, between moments in their journey when, they, when, they, when they're looking for uh, an excursion, when they arrive on dock as they're out cruising and so on. They want to be, to have that experience all connected uh, even after they depart, hey, send me some, in, send me, send me video from our excursion and so on, um, and and know where I am in that video, for example. And with all that we can do today with the technology that we have, people expect to have a little bit of wonder in their experience. And uh, we, uh, there are many experiences where we have had that. I just want to show some experiences that we kind of think of as mundane today, but they are really like all wonderful, I mean, uh, and, and inspiring. Um, you know, for example, uh, you're standing in line today, I don't know, we, everybody orders, uh, with some digital transformation here, everybody orders uh, online and orders through their digital assistants and their phones, right? I think this picture's funny, she's asking for carrots, she's cutting carrots. It seems like a stock photography failure, but, um, 
you know, that's, that's, a, that's a major improvement to, to going to the store. Um, another one, I, this is a pet peeve for me, I travel a lot and I, I lived in Boston and I had to take a lot of cabs and I really cannot stand cabs. Just dirty, rude drivers, people don't even talk to you, you know, there's uh, expensive. And of course, uh, you know, we have Uber, we have Lyft, and we think of this as mundane, but I'm, I want to bring this to your attention that, that, that it's not mundane in any way. We just become used to it. And so now it doesn't feel as wonderful, but it is uh, wonderful and we can keep iterating on that. Uh, going to the bank, same sort of concept. We don't need to go to the bank anymore. We have online banking. We can even deposit checks uh, with our, our, our devices. It's, it's crazy. And this is one that I think it, we're gonna see more of. And this is, very, this is uh, 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 technology I'm going to talk a little bit about AR here, right? Where this is applicable to the private sector, the public sector, the DOD, wherever, anywhere where you've got tasks to perform, where you've got a complex environment, you can use technology like this to really open up uh, the experience to explain what parts are, to ex have exploded diagrams. This can make us safer, more efficient, more effective. I, I, I think this, this is one of the technologies that I think will just really uh, arrive very shortly here. I mean, we're, everybody's pushing very hard. So we are here, okay? Now, everything that I'm gonna talk about with how we support these types of experiences, I think that you need to be doing those things already today. So if you're not doing them, you said, oh, okay, let me write this down, I need to work on these things. And later we'll talk about what's, what's a little coming. So <clears throat> headless architecture or mock architecture, who, who here is uh, using mock architecture in your environment? Nobody yet. Hmm. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about what this is. Or just headless APIs, right, you guys? Uh, let's, let's, let's just dig into this a little bit. So in, a, in a, a headless world, what we've done is take the head off of these monolithic platforms, and we've segmented the uh, services and capabilities into their own stovepipes, right? So you can see that here on the content management side of things. E the content management has its own persistence tier, its own business logic, its own set of APIs, and it's not in another monolithic architecture with another service. So if I want to combine that with workflow or commerce or anything else, I, I bring those APIs together, and then I can build any digital experience on top of it. Now this has solved a major problem for developers who really were fed up with uh, traditional content management systems. The business workers is coming to them and saying, hey, we, we want to do a digital assistant, we want to do a native mobile app, and they're saying, oh, I can't, I can't handle uh, working in that CMS. First of all, it's made to manage pages, it's not made to manage mobile applications and content for mobile applications, uh, I just have to hack around it. This kind of architecture, uh, just for CMS alone, revolutionary, but at the enterprise level, it creates a very agile enterprise. And I think you guys can see how you can recombine these things here. All right, now, another key technology is GraphQL. Okay, show of hands, who's using GraphQL? Okay, we got some GraphQL people. I think this is one of the most important technologies of our time. Uh, this is, you can sort of think of it as SQL for APIs, that's a, uh, you know, I don't know, that's a terrible characterization in some ways, but basically, um, it standardizes how we communicate with APIs, right? We, uh, let me show you a picture here uh, where you can see on the right-hand side where we're basically issuing a query to, uh, to this GraphQL server, and that query then is interpreted by the server against any backend system. So it doesn't matter what your persistence tier is. Is it a database, in fact? Is it a NoSQL system? Is it a content management system? Is it anything, it doesn't matter what the backend system is. I have a sort of standard way to query it. And I also can have a standard way for mutations or chain, making changes. And I have a standard way of um, uh, monitoring or like basically uh, asking for updates uh, asynchronously, getting events. So this is really powerful. And the key thing that it does for us is it raises adoption and it makes it so that once we're speaking a similar language, we can actually uh, then layer these uh, APIs on top of each other. It's all, we don't have bespoke APIs where we have to have versions. Uh, we can also each, the way the query works, because you describe what you want, just think about SQL, this is why I use this analogy. In a SQL statement, you describe what you want, 
You can make that query, and that data comes back. So it's just the data that you need, just the data that you want. Well, that's how GraphQL works. So this technology is very, very important for managing APIs, making APIs more manageable. And we live in an API-based world, especially in multi-channel. It's also really important for content management. I'm really, I really love this because we, we've, in content management, we've had JCR, we've had IECM, we've had um, CMIS. We've had so many standards that tried to get off the ground that never got off the ground. And they were just niche, and developers didn't really, you know, unless you were a hardcore content nerd, you just never got into it. Well, GraphQL kind of solves that problem. So I, I'm really excited about that. Another thing is uh, full stack, uh, new stacks and full stacks. Now, I'm not here to say that one language is better, you know, is, is JSON, is, is, is Node.js and uh, JavaScript better than, than Java, than uh, .NET, and so on. I mean, everybody has their opinion. I have mine, but I do think that the uh, JavaScript world has done a really good job of saying, hey, we want an uh, isomorphic kind of world for a developer to work in, where I work in JavaScript in the, in the UI, I want to work in JavaScript on the server, and I want to work with JavaScript on the back end, and I get efficiencies from that. I think the most important thing that came out of full stack development is ownership, ownership of the whole stack. Because that's what, that's what allows us to scale when we're doing development. The same thing is true with agile, uh, really traditional agile processes versus DevOps processes. You know, we, we've all been talking about agile for a long time, DevOps and so on. You guys get that kind of idea, but by, by saying, look, we don't have a development group and an ops group. We have a DevOps group. And what, 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 where do we get the efficiency? We get the efficiency from ownership. We get the efficiency from trust. And I think this is a key thing that we have to breed into our environments with the constituents that work in those environments. I'm going to show you a little bit later that, that right now it's just development and ops, but there's other constituents in a multi-channel space, in an in a omni-channel space. Also, we have great frameworks. Uh, these are just a few, Angular, React, and Vue. Uh, the, these, uh, the, the point here I want to say is that these are modern frameworks that have had the benefit of getting started their development started when we really got into this very API-centric world, and they're much more, uh, much more well-suited for this environment. I think this obviously is at the end of frameworks. As soon as people are done with one framework, they start on the next. Um, but these frameworks are a big deal, so you need to be looking at these kinds of things. And they, they work server-side, they work client-side, they, um, some of them render into native. Uh, applications, there's a lot of efficiency to be had here and scalability. Also, automation and orchestration. Uh, if you're going to scale your omni-channel experiences, uh, you cannot afford to be putting, uh, configuring computers and, uh, and solving uh, technical problems on the fly at scale. Like, uh, <clears throat> um, if something's going wrong, you need, the so you need the software itself to heal itself. So today we have technology uh, like Docker, like Kubernetes, um, that, that help uh, us containerize our applications. And Kubernetes is an example of a technology that allows us to have orchestration, to, ha to have the uh, system self-monitor itself, to heal itself when something's going wrong, to detect an acceleration of incoming traffic and start to scale. These are things that if, if, you, if you're not doing this, if this is not an approach you're taking, you can't, you just can't do it. You can't scale. So this is something you've got to take seriously. Also, in our world, we have Crafter Cloud actually runs on a lot of this stuff, and we, we basically can't handle, uh, you know, uh, doing changes by hand. This is something that's, again, not scalable from, uh, from an employee perspective. We, we treat infrastructure as code. We use GitOps to deploy that. And, um, and scale this infrastructure. So I think this is a key concept that we've got to that you've got to take on. And also cloud, uh, moving to cloud. Now there's a, we we deal with a lot of large organizations, a lot of people that have their own data centers still, um, some banks. And j just recently we have a big banking customer, one of the oldest banks in America, move to start to move to cloud, which is pretty interesting. Um, but the uh, the key here is. On your own infrastructure, you cannot get an economy of scale, either from a talent perspective um, and, uh, and a cost perspective for computers. And you basically have to buy, 
when you buy computers in your own racks, right, you're buying for what you think the biggest traffic's going to be, and then you have to have those servers. It just makes no sense. So if you want to have a dynamic uh, deployment environment that scales with your needs on demand, you've got to be in some kind of cloud environment that's made to do that, if that's a goal of yours. So I think, you know, again, a lot of these, I think a lot of these technologies would be familiar to you guys. You would say, okay, I kind of know about these things. And so I would say, in a way, we have omni-channel figured out, right? We, we, we create an environment where we can easily make new experiences on top of existing APIs. We have a way to automatically scale things. It's, it's, it seems like pretty figured out in a sense. Uh, so I didn't know where to go with this after this, so I did what any uh, person under pressure would do. I asked ChatGPT, you know, now that we've figured out everything in digital experience, what, what's next? And uh, it, it came back and said, you know, there's just going to be more. So you need to prepare <laughs> for more. I said, okay, more what? Okay, more mediums. And a good uh, example of a medium that I see uh, that's, that, you know, it's, it's really hot is just video. And, and, not, and not just like YouTube, like enterprise video, live streaming, on-demand video with your own security, with your own targeting, with your own uh, branding and so on. Um, basically, the cost of that has come way down. So more enterprises, large hotels and things like that want to have this capability in-house. Um, also think DOD, stuff like that, all makes sense. Channels. Um, this is a great example of, hey, I want to be able to go into a store and try things on. I don't know about you, but I, this is not an experience that I enjoy today, you know? Um, and uh, if you could just sort of say, like, okay, well, is this shirt going to look okay on me or what have you? This, this is pretty impressive. And there are, you know, there are some places that are doing stuff like this. Another thing is just features. Um, anybody who manages a product knows that there's just no end of features that your stakeholders want. They just always want something new, and then just another, another tweak, another tweak. Um, more integrations. There's never an end to integrations. And what all that means is more deployments more often. More deployments more often. Again, why do we need co uh, infrastructure and deployments as code and orchestration? Because more deployments more often. Another thing, more content. I'm in the content management space with Crafter CMS. So I see more uh, localized content, more translated content, more personalized content, where even though we thought we had it figured out in 2021, uh, people are still working on, on this. And this is a hard problem to scale. If you ever think about uh, you know, how many audiences are you trying to talk to, how many people do you need to write that content? Super hard problem. OK, now add translation to that. Now it's even harder. And there's all kinds of extra Cartesian products that we can get out of this kind of thing. Um, not just that, but now people say, OK, great. I wrote this awesome blog. We should make that a video. We should make that an ebook. We should make this into an infographic. And uh, you know, content teams are like, oh, that's a great idea. Who's going to do it? Right? So uh, there's just more content. Um, and, and this isn't something you can do easily. You can't just translate a, a blog into a video without really thinking through it and, uh, and trying to come up with like adapting it, that content for the medium. Also, we're not just writing content anymore for humans only. We write content for robots. Anybody who runs large sites or any sites, I think, now knows that in, in the SEO world, we're always trying to optimize for like that zero-click kind of experience. We want Google and other, uh, other sources where people go, like ChatGPT, to be able to easily consume our stuff and give answers and prioritize us because we're easy to work with. We also have more security vectors, OK? So one of the things that you see in that monolith, remember that monolithic architecture? There was no joints in that thing. So the security, the attack surface on that thing, you know, it's got its vulnerabilities. But for the most part, it's a box, and you can't get inside. Once you start to go into all these little individual surfaces and things where there's lots and lots of joints, there's more, we're always weakest at the joints. There's more attack vectors. I use this Harpley one here. This is just about like the worst thing that's ever happened in uh, recent internet time. Uh, but the whole point is there's just much, much more uh, scale. 
how do we scale that content production? How do we scale the security? How do, how do we do these things? So that's kind of what I want to spend the last 30, well, 20 minutes here talking about a little bit. So I think there's going to be another swing of the pendulum. We've gone from on-prem to SaaS, OK? And those are two extremes. But what we see in, in the market is people saying, OK, this is awesome, but I'm trying to make an omni-channel experience. I need to connect my data systems inside my enterprise. I need to, I, I want to know uh, at a technical level if there's quality of service. I want to monitor that SaaS. Go to a SaaS vendor today and tell them that you want to monitor their, your, their, their stuff. Am I going to, what? You know, uh, OK, here's your $10 a month back, you know, whatever. Um, so, so basically, I think uh, large organizations who have these omnichannel goals are saying, I want to kind of find a middle ground with that. And I think where that's headed is private SaaS, uh, is, is, a, is a SaaS, a certainly to the end users, a PaaS to developers, and a, a place where they can instrument it, they can integrate with it. Uh, they have some customization capabilities with it. Again, another key thing here is infrastructure as code. Hey, you can customize this thing, but it has to be infrastructure as code because we have to be able to push a button and stand it up again. So we have to do those things th before that we were talking about in order to get here. Another thing that I think is going to come back in a big way is, is, is open source. Now, that sounds weird because I'm not saying open source has gone anywhere. I've been working for an open source company for the last 10 years. So, um, you know, what I think is, is that the conversation has kind of shifted to, well, open source is important, but, you know, as a business, we don't need open source business conference anymore because uh, we have SaaS now, and that's how people deploy software, and that's how people think about software. But I think most people in this room understand that all of those SaaS platforms are built on open source, that open source is, is the best way to build software. I'm not, I'm not doing uh, open source because, uh, personally, because I think it's like, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, flowers and rainbows and stuff. I mean, it's certainly it's a great to be part of the community, and I'm, I like that. But I really think it's the best way to write software. It makes it transparent. It makes it, um, uh, it, 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 it provides the most room for ideas to come in. It produces the best things. And from an engineering perspective, I'm interested in producing the best things. And I think open source provides that. So I actually think because we're going to see a little bit of a back off of a pure SaaS play for some, some certain segment of the market, I think open source is going to become another big topic again. I don't know if we're going to need the open source business conference, but I certainly missed that one. Um, uh, Another thing that I think is going to happen is that CMS platforms are going to come, become more humane. So again, a synthesis of these two things. Uh, the CMS platforms the, traditionally were author-centric, right? So they were really, they were great platforms. If you asked any author, like up until 2009, do you like your CMS? They'd be like, I love this thing. It's awesome. It has all the tools that I need. It's easy. I'm making web pages. I'm super happy. The, they, they became unhappy when they couldn't get the next kind of device support, the, you know, the digital assistant, the, the support for a wearable or something like that. They went to the development team and said, I need that help. And the development said, OK, well, the problem is your CMS. I can't deliver because the CMS is the problem. So the developer said, there's no, there's, the, the answer here is let me make this thing a headless CMS. Uh, you'll have no presentation in your content. And as a result, all these visual tools that you're used to, we don't, presentation's not our concern. We're an API. So, uh, so you're going to enter content kind of in a, in, a, in a spreadsheet. So the developers all of a sudden got this like great experience. And authors got kind of content management that they had leading up to 2001. Uh, you know, very, um, very difficult interfaces to use. One of the things that we are thinking about at Crafter is, is this idea of headless plus. We work really hard on saying, OK, the content is captured as a, in a headless way. And I think there's lots of vendors. I'm not saying that Crafter is the only one working on this problem. But the content needs to be captured and stored in a presentationless fashion. It needs to be delivered by an API. It needs to be delivered by any technology that that organization wants to use. And still, the authors need to be able to drag and drop and kind of design it. Um, 
uh, on their own uh, with, with visual tools. So that's kind of one of the big things that's uh, coming is more headless plus. I think you're gonna see a lot more of that going forward. Another thing that is important is sort of bringing together this another set of constituents in the DevOps process. Content authors in an omni-channel space are as important as, as the features and the development and the functionality, uh, absolutely as important. But in every organization, they, they're never on equal footing. They're all, either they're like above the developers and the, the developers are you know, just serving them or they're below the developers and it's like, hey, you know, hey, we need to deploy something and you need to have a content freeze and, 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 and so on and so on and so on. So what, what we think is happening and what we're trying to make happen is to put these constituents on equal footing by putting them as part of the DevOps process, uh, which you can call Dev Content Ops. Now, to make this a little bit more practical, let's look at this map here. I, I dreamed of like the most complex deployment architecture I could think of here. Um, you know, edge computing all over the world, uh, you know, on your, your favorite private cloud, and uh, lots of replication, uh, good stuff, right? And um, this is just your production environment. Okay, but in reality, when we're innovating, we have lots of environments or landscapes, and they tend to be different sizes depending on, you know, whether they're staging, whether they're QA, whether they're load testing, whether they're for a developer machine. And one of the things that is really common in the content management space is, hey, I want to be able to get my content from production, and I want to bring it back to a lower environment. Or I have a new developer, and I want to put this infrastructure on their machine. All that stuff is really hard. If you've, been, if you've ever tried to do it, you know it's really hard. And there's really hard little nooks and crannies of this problem like, hey, uh, this content on the internet, we want you to have all this, most of the content, but not this private stuff on our internet. Or we're gonna release a big game and we don't want anybody in, you know, we have this small group of people that know about this game that we're releasing. We don't want anybody else to know about it. So don't share that with the other environments. So this problem is, is very challenging. And just think about most CMSs are based on a database. So syncing databases and then redacting stuff, it's challenging, it's custom scripts, it's all kinds of nonsense. Uh, at Crafter, we're trying to make that really simple with, uh, with uh, Git-based technology. We also wanna be able to push code forward from these lower environments in a very easy fashion, be able to deploy these things out to uh, large-scale infrastructures. So content back, code forward, that's kind of the, the essence of dev content ops. And doing this in a frictionless way where the, all the teams can work together and truly innovate at speed. There's all kinds of other things that I think are important there, like being able to pipeline releases and functionality. Because as you know, uh, organizations start working on things, let's say, uh, you know, a set of features and then something else comes up and they start, they move over and start working on that or create another team and start working on that. And with a lot of systems that we have today, it become, once you put something in the pipeline, it becomes difficult to move the other feature in front. And I think that that's a key part of Dev Content Ops is being able to, like we're used to with code and branches and things like that, being able to jockey what releases, what goes in that release, when it goes in the release and so on. So. This is, this, this is an area for a whole talk. We'll kind of I'll just leave it at that, but that's a key piece of it. Another key concept is low code and no code. Uh, this is something that uh, is, you know, is really gaining a lot of traction lately, and I think in the um, omni-channel space is an important topic because uh, basically development is, in a sense, is risk for businesses. They want to get out to market faster. They want to do that with less cost and uh, low code and no code solutions uh, offer a way to do that. So I think businesses are looking for those answers. And uh, this kind of takes us to the next shift, which is from suites that have all of our features to best of breed, which if you talk to people about best of breed, uh, some people hear kind of the marketing words and they're like, oh, best of breed, that sounds amazing. And a lot of other people hear I hear what you're saying is you can do the integration and you're gonna do a lot of development and that's a lot of risk for me and a lot of time and money. Um, so where, so okay great, I can get a perfect solution for my needs or I can get like the kitchen sink. Where's the middle ground, okay? So the middle ground is 
to take all of these now in individual services that we've created in our, like we talk, talked about our mock architecture, and I said that this is going to evolve. The middle ground is to take all of these services and package them up as business uh, capabilities. Now, has anybody heard of Composable? Have you got anybody following Gartner? Gartner's latest thing on Composable? Okay, we're gonna give a little brief cliff notes on Composable. So we're gonna take those stacks and we're gonna bundle them up as these packaged business capabilities. And you see these, they have these little interfaces on there. I'm gonna explain what they, look, what they are right now uh, in a minute. Uh, here we go. And you can see that inside of this, what you have is an autonomous building block, like a Lego, that represents a isolated business capability. And each one of these things has their own data model, their own set of services, and more importantly, that's encapsulated, and it exposes a set of events, a standard set of APIs, okay, and potentially experience um, a, um, what you might call like a micro front end. Okay, now the, what this allows us to do is it allows us to then build modular solutions where each component that has these capabilities can interlock and inter can interact with other uh, such capabilities. Really interestingly, this is not in a predefined way. You have to think of it this way. I just expose events. I just react to events, right? I have APIs. I can tell you about those APIs. I can tell you how to call those APIs, and then you call them and do interesting things with them. So what that allows me to do then is build composable architectures with these PCBs. So I can, for example, business problem A, I can grab a certain collection, and business problem B, I can grab some of those components and some new ones and compose a new solution. And another key piece of this is discoverability. I want to be able to go to a catalog of my packaged business capabilities and know what's there, know what they can do, and select them and pull them into my solution. To make all this work, I have to have an orchestration layer. I have to have something that knows how to receive those events, emit those events, send them to other subscribers, um, facilitate API calls, facilitate security. There's a whole orchestration uh, requirement on this. There's a, basically what, what I would call a bus, right? Now, does such a bus exist in a general sense that any vendor, you know, anybody's can plug anybody else's package business capability today into some common bus? No. The truth is no. It's very much like the early days of enterprise service buses, where the idea was there, the idea was great, and it took a long time for, uh, you know, it took some time at least for uh, platforms to show up to support this. So today this is a vendor specific thing. And for example, again at Crafter, we, we like this concept. We are building this concept into our CMS, and, um, but it works inside our ecosystem. I would love to find the day where there's more standards around this where I can more easily bring somebody else's capabilities. So for now, I have to say, okay, well, I understand your capabilities and I can wrap them and adapt them to my environment. So there's some strategies for this. But this, you can see that this, this kind of idea around microservices, it enables something special. And that is that the business can compose the solutions from a, a package business capability. A, a business person doesn't, who, using low code and no code style environments can now be the developer at the, business, at the problem layer, at the, at the business layer, they can compose the solutions. The developer then moves inside of any one of these little hexagons. They develop the capability, but th it's not development to connect them. So now all of a sudden, the speed is uh, much, much, much quicker. And the amount, of the, the amount of developers available to the space is much higher. So this is a, is a key concept. Here, another thing about it is that it nests. So I have a PBC. I can then compose an app from a PBC. And then I can compose my enterprise of PBCs. So this is an enterprise architecture approach. Um, and this comes from Gartner. I, I definitely encourage everybody here to check this out. This is, I think, a really uh, strong evolution of where we've been going with, with services and so on 
um, for the last uh, five or six years. Um, now, another key capability is AI, and everybody's talking about this, and I, I think it's something that we have to talk about. And um, in the content management space, I think some of the use cases are very obvious. These are pictures from Crafter CMS. Um, image and copy and other kinds of content generation. Of course, I, you know, coming up with blog titles is difficult. Coming up with images that I can uh, use without uh, having to pay royalties uh, is, can, you know, or, or more importantly, images that really match my content can be difficult. So this can be a, a major win in making our teams more efficient, uh, giving them options, um, and, uh, you know, these kinds of integrations. This happens to be with the uh, open API integration um, are really powerful. Another uh, example that we did was converting between mediums. We did this with uh, blogs to video uh, in Crafter, where we basically take a blog, have the, have the um, AI understand which, what each sentence is about, then generate an image for it with a certain set of image instructions, then speak the words, figure out how long that takes, now make audio, now string the images together into a video at that time, maybe add some music, et cetera. So, and, um, you know, this can, again, this is the way to scale on that content front. Hey, uh, you know, create, help me with that translation, help me with this kind of conversion, do these things. I think this is where AI can, it's, 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 it's easy, it's easy to see AI playing there and helping us. Um, here's another example, uh, classifying and enriching content. This is, uh, you know, again, motorcycles. I'm all about motorcycles. Um, but w at these kinds of events, you have some guy, some poor guy there that takes about 10 or 11 or 12,000 photos, and then he has to sort them by bike number. Um, and I don't know how we see the same guy over and over at events. He's not in some, in, you know, uh, institution somewhere. But uh, we did a little experiment where we could say, hey, we can, we can identify bikes, we can identify bike numbers, and we can uh, sort all those photos, and then you can just give those collections out, right? You, or you can create galleries based on that metadata. So AI can be a big help with these really labor-intensive tasks. And I think that there's, th these are all things that we've done. Now, things that are, I think, interesting, more interesting, are, you know, let's iterate on that um, personalization a little bit. Let's have AI generate some content. Now let's tell AI about who we're trying to talk to, whether it's parent, like say we're in the game industry again. Uh, it's a, a good industry for crafter. So we're, maybe we're talking to parents. Maybe we're talking to gamers. Maybe we're talking to gamers at a certain age uh, and so on, or, or organized play kind of uh, gamers. So let the AI take that generic content and personalize it into a specific kind of conversation. Now. That's useful in and of its own right. That allows us to scale beyond what we can, that's really the limiting factor today in personalization is just creating all the variants, right? People just, why doesn't personalization happen more today? Because people can't handle the workload. This handles that. But more interestingly, AI can now watch how those things perform and start to tweak the content. And I think that that kind of AI-directed personalization is, is um, something that could be really powerful. And of course, there's limitless kind of uh, use cases around this, I think. There's gonna be a ton of convergence, I think, where this really gets interesting. And now, we, now I've shown you like a thousand examples, right, of where one technology and another technology come together or one extreme to another extreme synthesizes into some new space. So we know, it's, we know it happens, but when you bring together like AI and composability, that can be extremely fast, extremely powerful. Um, and just pick any of these other things that we talked about. Um, I think, again, be aware uh, and leverage that rate of change uh, is a key concept for in being successful. I just want to reiterate that. Um, remember that the path is not uh, straight and will be messy. It is messy and it will be messy. And we want to look for the synthesis. We want to look for these things because this, we know that this is a valid pattern and we know that that kind of shows us that we're going in the right direction. Uh, all, again, uh, I think that, that uh, succeeding here is technical, it's challenging, it requires a lot of perseverance, but I think it's a very exciting space to be in. I think if you agree with those things and you wanna learn a little bit more, um, reach out to me at uh, rust.danner at CraftorCMS or check us out, uh, again, open source project, craftercms.com. 
and the open source project is .org. So I think I have about at least a couple minutes for questions. <laughs>